as we finish, I guess we can I maybe take five minutes and talk about the paper, otherwise we can we can just quit. This is um this paper is uh I thought I wanted to talk about it because it's something we haven't talked at all about in this class that of corrosion other, other, other than just in kind of oblique ways. But it is an, obviously an important electrochemical process and so I thought we should talk about it a little bit. So we are really ended up giving a very short shrift here by relegating it to the tail end of the class. But I thought we could look at it a little bit. This is a, um, they are talking about pitting of carbon steel. Does anybody know what they mean by pitting? What's, the, what's, what's happening when they're pitting? The elect what's the difference between corrosion as pitting and corrosion that you'd see in a 57 uh, Oldsmobile or something? The, the corrosion is not uniform up here like pits on the surface. Yeah. No, the, that's the that's what the the main thing with pitting is that instead of a uniform growth of a, a corrosion layer, you get a localized attack of the material, and um, and then in this case, they're talking about what's that mean? Metastable pitting. Does anybody remember what they're talking about? Technical, technical idea. Uh, meta, yeah, it, it, not in that. It, yeah, it sort of means that, but it means, really means it means it's not. A con, it's not uh, going to happen. Well, what basically what pits form? They can either repassivate and st in other words, stop growing, or they can continue to grow without any additional input. So there is a there is at some point in the system when you apply the right potential which can either be a potential you've implied yourself with your potential stat or the potential of the solution may be such that this works um, where the pits will continue to grow and metastable pitting is before that point. In other words they grow and for some reason they stop growing and then they and then the sol this surface becomes stable again by repassivating with a, uh, a layer of um, oxide. So the metastable pitting is studied because by understanding how these pits start, they can hopefully get some ideas how to stop them from starting in the first place. So you want to in order to stop pitting, you can sort of make the condition so that they either are always in a metastable condition or stopping the pits from forming in the first place. And uh, metastable is nice because it, the pits are forming and then passivating and forming and passing. So you're always getting lots and lots of pits, and so they can study large amounts of them. The problem with stable pitting is that once you get a pit forming on the surface, it tends to dominate all the rest of them. So as soon as one gets big enough to stable, the electric field becomes such that that one pit becomes the dominant one and so rather than hundreds or thousands of tiny metastable pits, you get one or two big pits and that limits your statistics that you can get. Um, I thought it was interesting because you see a, a, a different idea of how you do the experiments than we do in the other, um, the other uh, <coughs> types of experiments that we do. What's the, what's the main thing they're doing here? How are they studying the pits? What's the, what's the experimental technique? Uh, what's that abbreviation PSD stand for? They use that all the time. Power spectrum density. Right. Power spectrum.
from density. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> what are they, what's that power of what? What's the power, you know, they're talking about power in an electrical way. Well, they're studying, they're studying the noise on the, on the signal. In other words, they're looking at uh, noise, I guess it should be under quotes, because it's not noise in a typical kind of noise that we would see. What's the noise composed of in this particular case? What's the noise they're seeing from the caused by? Anodic current spikes? Yeah, what's, what's the anodic current spikes from? Getting the metastatic Right. Formation, repulsivation, formation, repulsivation. Yeah, so what's, why do you get an anodic current spike? What's the, what's happening exactly when you get an anodic current spike? The current is increasing anodically, so what's that mean is happening on the surface? Corrosion. So corrosion, but more precisely? Dissolution. Hmm? Dissolution. Yeah, but dissolution by what mechanism? Oxidation. Right, so you can oxidizing some amount of the material on the surface. It oxidizes at an ever-increasing rate because the, remember the current is a direct relate function of the rate, so the higher the current is, the more the rate is. And then it stops for some reason, then it decays back to zero, and you can see the figure four is a transient opinion. You can see what happens, it increases very rapidly, in fact, perhaps even more rapidly than they can measure, because you can see it goes from the baseline to the peak in one data point, and so, it may even be a higher peak than that. Um, so in other words, the peak point may actually be the decay of a, of a higher spike. <clears throat> so by looking at the noise, which is composed of what? What's the noise? It's all these spikes, right? And if they're, what's their, their assumption is, is that every time they have a spike, a noise spike, it's a current it's a little pit being grown and then passivating back to zero. So what's that tell them when they look at, how do they analyze those noise spikes? What's, what are they doing? What mathematical analysis are they performing? They're taking that time-based noise data and they're converting it to yeah, convert, converting the frequency. They're doing some sort of Fourier transform probably on the thing and they're getting a power spectrum which means that they can look at the, at what frequency is the most power being dissipated in the system. And by looking at that frequency, that should tell them essentially the, the time interval between the pitting process, right? Every time a pit, passivates and stops growing and then another one starts and is growing and so if they look at the interval between those points they can't see it directly from the noise because it's there's all of them are buried in there together but if they look at the power density they can see the the frequency at which that reaction is occurring and you can see the different current fluctuations of in those um, <coughs> I want to point out figure two. Notice how they do these polarization curves. Polarization curves are really just nothing more than current potential curves. They notice they're drawn on their side. So the potential which we normally draw on the bottom axis is on along, along the left axis. And the current is drawn as a logarithmic version of the current. And because it's logarithmic, they don't have negative current there because you don't have a logarithm of a negative number. So they take the absolute value of the current first and then they take the logarithm of it. So when you see those little spikes, it's just like the taffa plot when we had those spikes. They, that's the point which is going through zero. 
right? And so at more negative potentials where it goes up again, that's a cathodic process. At more positive potentials, that's the anodic process. So that's the difference. That you'll, you'll see these in corrosion literature, and that's, that's what you're seeing is the difference often. Okay. Uh, and then figure six has a um, different uh, power spectrum density plots for different potentials that they're applying and, and they're getting a lot of different data points. The problem is they have to then take that data and fit it to a model that they've developed. There's no direct numbers that they get right out of the thing. They have to mix a model of the pitting process and then fit it to that and see if their model fits the overall result. And um, this is a this is one of the things that people sometimes argue about in corrosion, whether this noise spectrum densities mean anything at all or if they can accurately predict the process. Anytime you have a model-based analysis, the problem is you have to know if your model of the physical thing is correct. And that's not possible to know that it's correct. All you can say is that it seems to fit the experimental data. So there's always an infinite number of possible models that could fit the data. The question is when can you, when is the model that you've picked out of the infinite number of possible models the right one? And so that's always the difficulty with model-based. Analysis. Of course, you can make good arguments that this is the simplest model, this is the model that seems to be, and you, know, you can use other data too besides, so. Um, but in the end, you're relying on the fact that you, uh, you're making an educated guess about the model. <clears throat> and you can see the probability measured and calculated, they seem to have a pretty good, uh, what you can get from the model is the uh, pit radius and the pit depth and how often they grow and what's the initiation times, how, how long does it take once it, that area repassivates to grow a new pit. All those things they want to know. They want to know how fast these things grow. They want to know uh, how they're doing. So they could take one pit and try to look exactly where a pit's going to form and then measure all these things with time. But, but since pits form all over the surface, they don't really have a prediction. Okay, pits are going to form right here where I'm looking at with my microscope. And because the pits are tiny, it's not so easy to see the pits as they grow. So this is one way of getting that information. Notice uh, particularly the um, figure um, seven <coughs> may or may not be reproduced very well in your, in your paper, but I think you can probably see figure A is that it says photograph of a metastable pit showing the cover over the pit mouth before and after cleaning. And so here's a stainless steel. So if you're looking at, even with a microscope, an optical microscope, exactly at that spot, and again, that's a pretty small area. It's a few microns across, maybe a few tens of microns across. You really can't see hardly anything there because there's a, what the, there's a cover. In fact, there, there's an oxide film, and the pit actually grows underneath the cover. And um, so, and that's one of the reasons it does grow is because there's a limited access of external solution inside the pit. As soon as that cover ruptures, that's often the cause of the metastable pitting to be, to quit. Because you have, to, in order to pitting to continue, you have to have a certain concentration of, of uh, solution species inside the pit. So you have a high concentration of metal ions and chloride usually in there. As soon as that cover goes away, the pitting stops. The problem is, you, as I said, you can't look at that spot beforehand and know if there's even a pit underneath that cover. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why it's sometimes difficult to directly study pitting processes at the initiation point. And so here's where they're using statistical methods to try to tease out some information about it. It's really fascinating, the processes that are happening under these conditions because they, they're so different than normal analytical processes which the, the current is controlled, the solution conditions are well controlled and all these things. Here you have migration, you have um, high IR drops, you have very high concentrations, molar concentrations in some 
place sometimes of these species you have stirring, you have differential concentrations all throughout the solution of sometimes oxygen is high, sometimes it's low, pH changes dramatically inside the pit and outside the pit, uh, the access is not uniform, so there's all kinds of uh, really strange things happening inside those pits and a very difficult problem to study exactly what's happening and that's what fascinates a lot of people in corrosion is figuring all those things out and that's one of the reasons why there are these model-based analysis because it's just too complicated to study directly. So they have to fit some simplified model to the data. But is there anything else that anybody saw in there that was? Yeah, I was going to ask the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I can't see anything directly why it would be so long. Usually that's so long that they have to rewrite it to resubmit well, it as a it new. It says revised manuscript, but also, do you have to pay to put yeah. a publication in, Steve? Well, oh. well, it's, uh, you don't actually have to pay, but, um, but you do, um, but you do in this case, you can pay or not. Well, if there is a publication charge. If you're going to keep the copyrights, then you will have to pay. No. Well, you, you can, you can, you, you don't get the copyrights whether you pay or not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the only in certain cases, the government, the federal government does not transfer copyrights. So if you were a federal government employee, you, you can be a situation where you, the copyrights are not transferred. Also, if you are a foreign national and you you cannot be compelled to transfer copyrights, um, and that's also possible sometimes. So foreign uh, research groups sometimes do not get tra copyrights transferred over. Uh, but otherwise, it's the uh, you really they just say, we, "Sorry, we ain't gonna publish it unless you." So. But no, actually, you can you can you can say well, I don't have the money, and you can get it published without it. And in fact, they claim that it doesn't change the time it takes to publish it. And but you know, it'd be a shame if the material got uh, kind of delayed. And then. <laughs> Do you have to pay then to, to publish in these journals? No, you no, you don't have to pay. But uh, you, in fact, people publish all the time without paying publication or page charges, what they call them. But. Uh, the um, might be delayed for five years or so. Yeah, there may be a delay, an unfortunate delay. <laughs> but you know, reprints are expensive and publication is expensive. Yeah. So this is a one journal where the reprints are very expensive. And, but some, you know, some, some the ACS journals don't have page charges as a rule, but uh, but almost all the private journals have page charges. So this is the private journal. Yeah. That's it's the Journal of Electrochemical Society. So, and you get a break if you're a member, but not that much of a break. Mm -hmm. One of them, the one that paid for it, was a member. Yeah. Oh. Where did the names go? Well, the I don't really know why they get away with it, but it, I mean it's a. The point is, is you'd have to pay more for subscription charges if you didn't pay the page charges, but, uh, you know. Could be that they just took a long time to send a revised manuscript. Usually if it's that long of a time, you can't, the, there's a limit. There's a certain number of months in which mm -hmm. if you don't revise it within a certain amount of time, they will treat it as a new submission and send it out for review again and so on. So, um, which is not what you want. Probably what happened is that there was a number of uh, revision cycles where they sent it out, sent it back, sent it out, sent it back, and uh, finally got published. Probably one of the problems was the... Where in Canada did you work? Where in Canada did you work? So this one probably... Um, Probably has some trouble with the, their model or their analysis. Like I said, it's controversial, and so you can get into trouble. There's people that have very strong opinions, and so you can get a reviewer that doesn't like your model, and that's too bad. Well, well, usually you can choose 
your reviewer also, right? Yeah, that's what they ask people right now. You have to suggest some names for the review. Well, you can, you can, you can yeah. yeah. You can put people down. That doesn't mean they're going to use them. And right. they, they often will use some of your suggested reviewers, but usually the problem is not so much the ones you want, but the ones you don't want. <laughs> And it's di more difficult. It's more difficult to suggest that somebody not review your article. Although you can, you can always ask. Uh, they are free to ignore your advice or your suggestions. <laughs> <laughs>